Good evening, good evening. What a treat to be here with you all this evening. <coughs> I'm Tony Marks, I'm the president of the New York Public Library, and it is my honor and my pleasure to be introducing this event tonight with the great Hortense Le Gentil talking about her newest book, The Unlocked Leader. Uh, Hortense, as we all know, already has written an amazing set of work, including most recently before this, Aligned. She is also a phenomenal coach. And I say that because anything that good happens at the library is because of Hortense's coaching. <laughs> In this book, as you're going to hear tonight, and for those of you who haven't read it, you must, you really must, Hortense, as always, starts at the, the roots, the root causes, including the root causes that go back to trauma, that lead us to fear our emotions, to fear chaos, to fear failing, and therefore to fear trying in a true sense. This can lead us to lock out the parts of ourselves that we need and to lock out our understanding of others, which God knows the world needs. And we hit a wall, we get stuck. And then, as she describes it, something amazing is possible. I kept thinking of Robert Frost's line, the only way out is through. Artance understands that with help, her help from this book and in person as you're about to also see, we can live lives of empathy. We can, in our work lives, address our passions, to help others envision their own authentic life. Hortense lives that life that way and shares and inspires the rest of us to do the same as a friend and as a coach, which in her case seems almost inseparable. Hortense is also part of our family she comes by that, uh, by the most respectable channel, introduced by Marshall Goldsmith, the amazing coach who I also benefited from, who's here with us tonight, the number one coach in the world. There isn't even competition. Well, no, sorry, there is competition. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> And, of course, we're also honored to have uh, my next coach after that, after Marshall, was Hubert, Hubert Jolie, uh, who is also a member now of the Board of Trustees here. I just want a special shout out to both Hubert and Hortense for their generosity to the library through the Best Buy Foundation and the Jolie Family Foundation. They have helped us to create five Best Buy teen tech centers in some of the poorest neighborhoods in New York. Hortense will be speaking tonight with Heather Landy. She is an executive editor at Quartz and a founder of Quartz at Work. She's also been editor at Chief, the American Banker, and a special correspondent at the Washington Post. You'll find their full bios in the program. The conversation tonight is presented by the Thomas Yoseloff Business Center here at the Stavros Niarchos Foundation Library. For those of you who have not yet explored this building, it used to be the benighted Mid-Manhattan Library. It's where I felt comfortable coming in high school. That building across the street was way too fancy. But this was a dump, and it had been that way and allowed to be that way for decades. $200 million later, thanks to the generosity of the city and the New Yorkos Foundation and others, it is the central branch library New Yorkers have always deserved, starting with a kids and teen center in the basement, the largest circulating library, an entire floor for gaining skills, job skills, and then an entire floor, the Yosolov Center, to help you create a business or to find a job, with, including with individual one-on-one -on -one free counseling. So we here are in the, in the work of sharing wisdom in the areas of business and values and how they connect. And so what could be more appropriate than to have Hortense doing the same with us this evening? This, she does so 
tonight in person as she does in her book. And that book is available for sale outside or through our library shop. The proceeds will be donated to the Jed Foundation, an amazing organization that does great work to help young adult mental health issues. And of course, you can also borrow it from the New York Public Library. <laughs> we hope you'll have some questions. You'll find note cards at your seats, including those really cute little golf pencils. Um, my colleagues will come around. If you're watching online, welcome. And you can also submit your questions in the chat or at the email, one word, public programs at nypl.org. Now please join me in the tonight's treat in welcoming Heather and Hortense. Great lights out there. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you so much for braving the dreary New York weather. We're about to kick all that gloominess aside because Hortense has a beautiful book and a beautiful message to share with all of you. And um, before I ask her to delve too deep into that message, I wanted to do a little bit of level setting. There are a few important concepts that are sort of a refrain throughout the book. Um, if you get the book, I promise she explains it beautifully in the book, but um, for those of you who haven't yet had a chance to read it, as I have, um, why don't we start with a few definitions, or Hortense, uh, so that people can really understand the conversation tonight. Um, you talk a lot in the book about mind traps. What is a mind trap? So a mind trap is a mental obstacle that stand between you today and you tomorrow. You feel stuck, you cannot move forward. And uh, this is how, you know, it is wh what is a mind trap. And where do they come from? Is it just the crush of a deadline or a load of work or is it something else? No, it can come from different places. So, but first, yeah, let's continue the definition of a mind trap. You feel also, it's, it's a stage in your life, uh, one, a moment in your life, when you feel, you feel, you can feel unhappy, unsatisfied. Uh, you can feel um, even arrogant, or, you know, at the, contra uh, you know, the contrast is uh, the um, imposter syndrome. Feel this, feel this syndrome or so. So you don't, f you don't feel well, you don't feel whole, but you don't know why. So you do it and do it and do it again. You used to do that way, and one day it doesn't work anymore, and you don't know why. So this is really this, this feeling, in fact. And um, so where it's come from? And it's happened to everyone, and it happened to me. And it happened to me, 20, 15 years ago, something like that, about 50 years ago, I felt in my life, I felt I didn't live my life. I was not in my life. I was not all. I didn't belong. And I felt that I was more living a life for others than for me. I couldn't express myself. I felt, at that moment, I felt completely locked in my marriage and locked also in my professional life. And I didn't know what to do, absolutely not. So I was there, and um, it was a low point in my life. And uh, at, mo at one point, everything went south, and I was locked in bed, sick in bed. So really, I had to do something. And I had a dream. My grandmother, so my grandmother I just loved, came to me, she was died, uh, she died at, this uh, at that time, in my dream, and she told me, find the path of roses. I said, what is this? <laughs> I absolutely don't know what she's talking about. So I asked her, where is it? And she just smiled, and she told me, you know where it is. And she disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> so I woke up, I was angry, I was furious, 
she didn't give me the answer, you know, come back. <laughs> and uh, that would be much later, so they will understand that what she meant was that she, I didn't listen to my own voice. I was listening to other voices, external voices, but not mine. Do I wait? Stop there. <laughs> It's so interesting that you mentioned that being sick in bed. There are physical symptoms, or there mm. can be, of emotional mind traps, psychological mind traps. And you talk about this idea that they can come from external sources. Where, mm -hmm. where else are we likely yeah. to find mind traps? Mind traps, yeah. So I would say that you know, listen, not listening to your voice is a common mind trap. You know think about it, I'm sure, you know, somewhere it's it happened to you. The second one, uh, I would say, is coming from a trauma. So what is a trauma? A trauma is an event or something, a series of events that happen in your life and um, struggle big emotions like fear, like guilt, like shame, like powerlessness, like, you know, everything, everything like that. And so it triggers also your, your sense of safety. And what happens is it gets stuck somewhere in, in our brain, in our, in our heart, and uh, you cannot have the big picture, and you cannot, and it, you know, and it also defer to the, the way you look at yourself and the way you look at, um, at others. It's really, to, it, it's really to, um, also, uh, sorry, uh, you know, yeah, sorry. And, um, and um, so let me give you um, a met metaphor. Our brain is a house, okay, our brain is a house. In the house, in your house, you have, you know, some rooms. So in, the, in your room, in your bedroom, you put your bed. In your living room, you put your sofa, right? So imagine now that you have a car in the middle of the living room. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. If you s want to sit on your sofa and you watch TV, you, you cannot see. So a trauma, it's exactly the same. It's something in your brain that is not at the right place. So you didn't process you know, the, the, um, the trauma. So the trauma is still there at the wrong place. So because of it, you cannot, you cannot relate to others like you should do. And as a, as a leader, it's a real problem because you cannot, you, you cannot feel, you cannot be really yourself. So being aware of your trauma and where it's coming from, yeah, this is something very important also, I would say. So the stream that you had led you on a quest of sorts that ultimately landed you in what you call in the book a mind shift. So define for us a little bit uh, what is exactly a mind shift and how do we achieve this process? Okay. So if I just um, go back to the, the mind trap, so because it's a mental obstacle, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Because it's a mental obstacle, uh, it's stories that uh, that you know our brain is uh, making for us. It's all, everything is stories, so it's good news because a story you can rewrite the story. And so here you you are with your stories, your trauma, your voices, whatever it is, and um, you want to change. So you go through you know this transformation, and the first step is to challenge those beliefs or this voice, and the belief that are behind the voices, with three questions. Is it true? Is it relevant? Is it helpful? And so you have, for example, um, if I go back to my story quickly, um, is it true? So I was listening to an external voice. Voices. So is it true that you, you cannot divorce? Is it true that you cannot be an entrepreneur? At the age of 40, everybody says it's mindless. And I said, no, 
I answer no, so I say no, and I'm going to follow my voice. So, but because I freed myself, you know, when I understood that I had to listen to my own voice, my inner voice. But let me take you on another, uh, another example. We, a leader, years ago, uh, was um, was uh, attending, was pretending to be uh, the next CEO of the company. And he was a very successful CEO. Everything was great. And uh, so we went uh, in front of uh, uh, a panel of, uh, of leaders, you know, responsible to this process. And he didn't understand what's happened. Out of the blue, his behavior completely changed. And uh, he began to be very talkative and to not listen. So of course he lost it. And nobody understood. So we had this conversation, and uh, we have to. We had to find the source of the mind trap. So where it was, where it's coming from. And revisiting his life, he remembered that 30 years before, he was a student. <laughs> 30 years before, he had to pass an oral oral exam. And uh, he had to be in front of uh, a panel of professors. And one of the professors didn't let him talk. He couldn't speak. He couldn't, you know, he couldn't express himself. So, of course, he lost his cool. And, of course, you know, he was shocked. And this professor told him, young guy, I promise you, you will never be a CEO because you cannot handle your emotions. Mm. And in fact, in his, you know, in his brain and in his heart, everything stayed stuck 30 years before. And he didn't realize, because he had this car in the middle of the living room, but he didn't realize because it, it was the first time for him, you know, to face, you know, to be, uh, to, to try to be a CEO. So that's why his behavior completely changed. So I asked him so three questions. Is it true that you cannot be a CEO? Is it relevant today? Is it helpful today? And he said, no, no, no. So we decided to let go, mm -hmm. like Marshall would say. <laughs> Let go. So we worked on how to let go. And he freed himself, really. He freed himself because he felt released and he said, OK, so now I can be myself. I know where it's coming from. And of course, he had, you know, later on, he had a CEO position in, his, uh, in another company, but uh, a very, very good, uh, you know, position too. I think so many of us can relate to the mind tra having the mind traps that you've talked about. and. Maybe some smaller subset of us can relate to the process of coming to that mind shift and deciding we won't be weighed down by the old baggage, the old thinking. Um, the very few of us who are lucky to make it through that process and truly unlock ourselves, as you mm -hmm. say, what does that look like? What does the unlocked leader actually look like in practice? So now that uh, you free, you understand, you understood where it's coming from. Your mind trap, you understood where your uh, mind traps are coming from. Now that you, you know, shift your your your, your mental, so you change your mindset, and you understood also that all it's all about stories because it's, it's there are the stories that we tell ourselves, and uh, so now you can be the author of your life because you are free. You freed yourself. So let's write your life. And this is when you begin to, um, okay, to um, go back to your life, take the time to think about what drives you. What is your why? What is important for you? And also think about what kind of leader you want to be. How do you want to be remembered? And there you can do an exercise that I like to give is to write your eulogy. 
It's not very funny, not at all. It's hard. But you will understand really what matters to you if you do that. And so when you're sure of that, and why it's important to, to have that is because it's going to be your compass, your North Star, your true north. Each time you go back there, because you know your why, you know your direction, this is it, okay. And how you continue to do that, because now it's a new behavior, you write a new story, so it's a new muscle, you're working on, a, on your new muscle. So what you have to do is to, uh, on this muscle, to work on it daily, in a daily basis. So every day, you work on it, so imagine you decided that you want to, uh, you decided to um, do your best to listen to your own voice. So you write down everything that you decided to uh, change, uh, questions or affirmation. And I like to say it's your daily rendezvous. You have a rendezvous. You have to meet with yourself. It's important. And uh, you meet with yourself and um, you see if you are still on track. And this is very important because if you don't do that, you're going to go back to you know what you, you were used to do, right? So this is important. And to me, there is one person who is today with us and uh, who is the definition of an unlock leader. And uh, this is Ralph Lauren. This is you, Ralph. Yeah. Thank you for being with us today. Tonight, it's not tonight. I'm so honored to have you. <laughs> yeah, you're my job, darling. <laughs> but you know why you are, you are, for me, you know, the definition of the unlock leader is because you always followed your, your, your voice, right? And so, and you follow your, your dream. So I think that everybody knows the story, so I'm going to try to tell the story very fast. If I do wrong, you should tell me. Yeah? <laughs> but everybody knows, you know, the story of a, uh, the young man, uh, born in the Bronx, who designed very beautiful tie and uh, white ties and went to Bloomingdale's to try to sell it. They told you, you were told that, okay, we are going to take it, but to take them, but um, more uh, narrow and without the polo label. And you just say, hmm, I'm not going to do that. And you left because you wanted to, you know, you believed in your dream, right, Ricky? It was that. You believe in your dream, and, um, and so you decided, and at that time you were, not, you were young Ralph, so you didn't have the empire that you have today. So it was very risky. So I can imagine, Ricky, you know, how you felt. <laughs> you were very courageous, but, you know, you were, you so believed in your dream of a, uh, a better life that you follow your dream and the rest is a story. And more than 50 years now, you continue to impress us, to, imp impress us, to inspire us. And uh, your last fashion show was absolutely amazing, as, a, as usual. And uh, thank you for that. Thank you for inspiring us. <laughs> a dream of a better life and thank, uh, thank you for inspiring me. A dream of a better life. Thank you for sharing with us and thank you, Risky. So for me, <laughs> yeah, this is everything about an unlock leader. Fabulous. Plus, releasing us all from the tyranny of skinny ties. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> all of the concepts that, that we've talked about, I, I mean, I'm struck in thinking that really anybody could relate to what you've discussed here today. We all have traumas, we all have things that lock us, so that we, we all have um, issues that we need to identify and move past and um, to find the authenticity that we need. But this book is very squarely aimed at leaders. So what is it about leaders and leadership that um, was so important to you to bring this message to? Why is it so important for leaders to hear this as opposed to just and any of mm -hmm. us? 
It's because for, first I would say that um, everybody is a leader because at, at the minimum you are a leader of your life. So I think it's for everyone. But leader, leaders in, in leadership is because in business is because you know the world change. You, we know we know that right. <laughs> it's not a big scoop. And um, so it changed. <laughs> and uh, so people expectation has changed. So your customer expectation change, your employee expectation change. So they don't need another hero, as Tina Turner said. <laughs> we don't need another hero. <laughs> we need a human leader. We need somebody, they need somebody with who they can connect. That's why it's important today. You know, and, and I think it's so interesting and important that you frame that as being important not just to leaders' employees, but to their customers. Because that this really is, at the end of the day, part of business and not just being a nice person that people want to work for for yeah. the sake of being nice, but for those of us that have a business interest as well, a bottom line interest, this is actually part of that. Exactly. Because also, uh, when you are human, you know, the difference is uh, people can connect with you. People, you know, if you are authentic, uh, if you are vulnerable, if you share, people can connect with you. This is the only way to connect to each other. If you just pretend that you are the best, you know, uh, no problem, no thing, you know, you are the best in class and uh, nothing happened in your life, mm, I think uh, you are more a robot than, uh, you know, than a human being that doesn't exist. And um, how we connect is that by sharing stories, uh, because this is how our brain is, is connecting us, by sharing stories and, be, and by being authentic and being you. I think we've already made so much progress in workplaces from the days of Neutron Jack and uh, Chainsaw Al to the, the more empathetic leadership models that we see today. But when I think about future leaders, uh, and what they've experienced as a collective trauma, uh, whether we're talking about the pandemic uh, of COVID-19, uh, about climate change and what we all saw this summer, it is you know the havoc that it is uh, wreaking on people's lives um, and is no longer just a, 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 an abstract um, bit of science. Um, what do you think will happen? Are, are these going to be mind traps for a whole future generation of leaders? And how are, should we define that as a mind trap? And if so, how, how do they release themselves from that? I will say yes, because um, as we, t we said just before, you know, trauma, it's a trauma, right? Uh, it's a trauma. So it's a mind trap can be a mind trap if, you know, again, you know, the car is not in the garage and still in your living room. And uh, so it's a trauma. So, yes, it's a mind trap, I think. Uh, and the uh, young generation, the young leaders, the future leaders are going to ask them the, the, this question. What is my future? So it's a big question. And uh, but I'm very confident because they can rewrite your story. So if you write the story, so you, you work on, uh, on yourself and you write the story and rewrite the story to a narrative that gives you purpose to make a better world, I think they will be great leaders. And uh, it's always the same, you know, in crisis, in difficult moment, you always have a hidden, hidden gift. So what lesson can we take from it? What can we learn from it? And how can we move forward and not stay yes, stuck in the why me, what happened to us, our generation, whatever. And I'm very confident, you know, they are very clever and um, we can make it. They will make it. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Um, Artans, I know you're not a neurologist or a psychologist, although a lot of people have trouble telling the difference between, <laughs> say, a psychologist and a coach. Um, but you have done some really deep research for this book and for your coaching practice in general into how the human brain works. Um, 
What is the most important thing that you have learned about that um, as it pertains to mind traps and mind shifts and, and models of empathy? I think that, um, so as we said, we are all connected and like uh, the trees in a forest. So how we connect is through our brain and how through neurons. So this is how we connect, and this is how our brain makes stories, and you know, and this story talk to you, you, your brain with making another story. So this is how how it works, and so my favorite neurons are you know the mirror neurons, also called the Gandhi neurons, and it, and they matter for what? For two reasons. The first one is because those neurons can help you to imitate, to learn. I will come back to that. And the second one is the neuron, um, and the second reason is because it's empathy. This is because of that. It gives you the ability to, to feel uh, you know, the, the same thing, to feel with the person, uh, to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else. So if I come back to the first one, so to imitate and mirrors. So, Either if I decide right now, just you know to change the size of my, you know my foot like that. See, so what's going to happen is okay. My my brain you know give you know order to my legs to change, and your brain is doing the same, and not surprisingly, hop you see yourself you know changing size. You don't you don't you are not aware of it, but you do it. I'm sure it happened. If, if you if you look at it and uh, you are you are careful, it, it happened to everyone because this is neurons, mirror neurons, neurons mirror. So that's why we say that. So you can imitate, and why it is important. So important to learn. So I think if you uh, Im if you imagine also um, a mother or a father with a baby and spooning the spooning the baby, ah, you open the. You open your mouth like that mm -hmm. uh, to make you know, the baby open, open, open the mouth, right? This is you, uh, this is mirror neurons. They are uh, mirror neurons, and why it matters for a leader is because it's less about what you say and more about what you do, mm. because you are a role model, and so people are going to look at you. So what you do, they are going to do the same. So be careful. You have a responsibility. And if I go back to the second one, so um, very well-known uh, neuroscientist, Ramachandran, name uh, name them by Gandhi neurons, because yes, it gives you the ability to put yourself in other uh, someone else's shoes, to feel. In fact, this is what we call empathy, and empathy is the ability to feel in. It's empathy, in fact. So you feel, you feel with the person. You can understand the person in front of yourself. And why is it important? Is because it's all about the human being. It's important to understand the person in front of you because for many reasons, and especially as a leader, it's important to know who is in front of you, you know, what's happened. And it's important to understand what is, you know, what is, is not said and more and, and to listen and to feel. And same with your customer, because if you cannot try to feel how your customer feel, how, you, how can you design you know, the, a new tie, right? Because you cannot feel. You don't know. If you don't connect with people, you don't know. You don't have empathy. So this is also very important. So I think this is what I learned <laughs> the most is that we are all interconnected and thanks our neurons and our neurons and now I, we are all interconnected so be careful because <laughs> I think you're going to speak French or American with a French you know <laughs> accent very soon <laughs> <laughs> I love that you have a favorite neuron <laughs> right now I do too um, when I think about the leaders that are celebrated most these days, it's you near know, in the past few years, it's people like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and Bill Gates when he was at Microsoft. And some people might have, or indeed have, described 
a lot of these figures is lacking an empathy gene. Um, why do you think there are so few empathetic leaders? I can't answer this question really because um, I would guess that they are trapped somewhere and they are afraid. So I think that fear is one of the first obstacles to begin your journey uh, of being authentic and uh, being yourself. And what, what else can we do, any of us, to work on our empathy? Just try to learn how to listen more, to observe more, to speak last or less, ask questions. The research shows also that meditation helps a lot, right? I get it. And a lot, a lot. So it's a good thing. And also role play. You can, you know, role play if you feel not comfortable to share something and you can with somebody that you trust um, role play and see, you know, what do you feel to, to feel more comfortable to share things and to know where to begin and where, where, to, uh, where to stop. I do have a few more questions for you, but I just want to quickly remind the audience that Hortense will take questions. So if you have one, please feel free to write one on your card and wave it. It will be picked up. And uh, for people watching online, uh, you can write your questions in the chat, and they'll be noted um, by the staff here at the library. Um, Artans, there is a beautiful fable of sorts running through the chapters of your book um, based on that dream that you said at the outset that you had about your grandmother. Um, tell us a little bit more about that dream uh, and what message um, you get from it that you really want to convey to people with this book. Mm. So you understood that that dream is the beginning of my journey and the uh, to free myself, so I wanted to share with you. But if I come back to the origin of the idea, so I always, uh, one of my favorite book is uh, Le Petit Prince, so The Little Prince of uh, Saint-Exupéry. Saint it's not only for children, <laughs> because I read and reread and reread, you know, uh, again and again, and each time I learn something. Uh, there is a lot of philosophy behind that. And so, with Caroline, that I think you know is online. So Caroline, we miss you. Caroline Lambert, you know my collaborator and my friend with who, with who I wrote the book. So Caroline and I, two years ago, we decided to um, you know to create a fable uh, as a, so this little child who is going through his past a path of roses. And, uh, and and he's going to find you know his path of roses. And each chapter begins by the fable for two reasons. The first reason is to be a companion for you. So I hope you will like it. And the second reason is because it's a fable, so it opens your the right side of, of your brain before you know entering the chapter. So each each um, each introduction, each, each uh, beginning of the, of the chapter is introducing uh, the idea of the chapter. And you go through all you know, the, the, the journey until the end and how we found uh, the Path of Roses. And um, I hope that you will find your Path of Roses also in reading this book. That is the perfect segue, I think, to some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so while we gather some note cards, I also just wanted to mention that um, Hortense has chosen to donate the proceeds of her book to the Jed Foundation, which works on young people's mental health and suicide prevention. I think there are some, thank you, some of the senior folks from Jed are with us tonight. And thank you so much. Uh, as mom of a teenage daughter, I'm very grateful for what you do. Yes, very grateful. Uh, so let's see. Um, question from the audience. How did you find your rose, your path of roses? And this is very interesting. How long did it take you? <laughs> oh, 
Okay, so it's a journey. It's not a destination, by the way. So uh, either I think you have something. So how I find uh, it's day after day that I recreated my um, my story. So I so I left um, I left my marriage and uh, I became an entrepreneur. And I put I had a, a white page and on that page I put every day what I liked I went and the people that I liked and gave me energy I had had new friends and um, and they created my life so it took me a long time uh, it took me mm, a decade a decade or more uh, until I'm here until now and um, and I think it's not finished because it's again it's a, it's not a destination. So it takes time, you have to be passionate, but you will see, if you begin the work, it works. It works. And everything changed, because your energy change, you are so more yourself, of yourself, that you will discover, in fact, yourself, and others around you are going to discover yourself also. And so things are going to happen. And you also, you will see uh, differently the world and people. So it's fantastic. It's wonderful, but be patient. Takes time. But each time is nice. A related question. What did you learn about yourself in the process of writing this book? Interesting. I think it's uh, we don't take enough time to, to think about our journey, our own journey. So to write a book, it's hard. <laughs> It's very hard. So thank you again, Caroline. <laughs> and we are both of us, so, you know, without her, I don't know uh, what I would do. Um, so it's hard, but it's helped me to um, go back to the essential, to see what I learned and what was important, and to try to find an arc to help others also. So I think I grew up because I, I, I felt that at the end of the book, I had fun at the end of the book, really. I had fun. I just loved, you know, wrote uh, stories and did all the research and things like that. And so um, I felt like um, I grew up. And, um, yeah, having this step back uh, on your life, it's very important. It's a great question. I think of my... This is the question writer talking, not me, but... Uh, I think of myself as a very human leader. It just comes naturally to me, but, underline, how do I lead humanely when my superior is not yet a human leader? I feel stuck. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, okay. I would say that um, you cannot change People. So people has to change by themselves. So if you, you, it's your way to lead, I will encourage you to continue because anyway, you have your, your team. You have your, your people. You have the person with who, so you have your influence, so your, your zone of influence. So keep doing. Keep doing exactly as you think it's the right thing to do. The human things. And you know, if your know, superior um, doesn't doesn't see it at one moment, or it doesn't fit, something happen. Uh, continue to do that, and you will see. And one day, anyway, something is going to happen. No worries. Um, but continue, continue, and and focus on on what works, where 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 you can work, and with who, uh, which team, and uh, how you can help uh, your team. Don't change your way to try to role model something that is not for you. Never. Would you advise in that instance explaining to your superior what it is that you're doing, why it is that you're operating your team this way? You Maybe. can you can try. You can try to give some feedback if the person <laughs> wants to have feedback, but uh, maybe maybe sometimes they don't. But again, you know, one thing that I learned in my, <laughs> my experience is don't try to convince someone who doesn't want to be convinced, it's not going to work. 
Maybe the Gandhi neurons to kick in, so they just start mimicking yeah, us. Yes, except if you see that you know a door is open and uh, something is possible, so maybe you know this person doesn't know, or maybe you know this person feels fear, so maybe you can have a conversation with this person, and maybe he can or she can um, have a coach or somebody with who she is. they can work, and and maybe yeah, maybe it's uh, ch life changing this conversation. So yeah. To whoever wrote that question, have your boss call or taunts. I think that's <laughs> the answer. Um, oh, great. Some more questions. Uh, what mind traps affect young female leaders specifically? Any advice for female leaders? Um, I think like female or male, but maybe especially female. But I, th I see in both, uh, both case, cases, but stop to try to be perfect. <laughs> Absolutely second that. Uh, okay. Uh, going back to Heather's question, my question, about Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, arguably not unlocked leaders, but very extrinsically successful. How do you believe their leadership or success might be different or better if they had overcome their mind traps? In the case of uh, Steve Jobs, I think at the end of his life, he changed. Mm. <laughs> he absolutely changed, and this is why we remain, you know, you know, the memory that we have of him is not a bad memory at all. He was a genius for sure, but he was stuck. <laughs> so, and one day discover himself. So, you never know when you are ready to discover yourself. So, and he changed everything, right? He changed everything, I think. And um, and, uh, I, and I don't know about uh, Elon Musk. I don't know. I don't know him. And anyway, who I am to judge, I absolutely don't know. So the only thing that I can I can say is, um, if you have this power, this genius, and you put this genius in service of others, wow. I think you know you can be do much better than you do, and you can you know create a better world. And uh, better people, and you know, more happy people, and you know, people can unleash, and and uh, it makes a difference. I don't know Elon Musk personally, but I did just read a 600-page book about him. <laughs> and so courageous. Um, <laughs> my impression of it is that from it is that he knows that he is stuck, mm -hmm. uh, and he doesn't quite know how to, how to unlock. start that shift mm -hmm. process, that mind shift mm -hmm. to unlock. Reading the books, yeah, Gaffy, thank you. <laughs> I know, yes, Elon Musk also should be calling Hortense. Um, if you don't mind getting vulnerable for a minute, Hortense, a question uh, asks, have you ever been locked in your work? In my work? Uh, oh, yes, of course. So um, it was when, when I was an entrepreneur. Also, okay, so it's <laughs> another story. <laughs> you don't have time for that story. Uh, but very fast, I was an entrepreneur in the recycling steel industry. Um, <laughs> industry w w with uh, all male. I was the only woman around. It was very interesting. I learned a lot, a lot. So I created, you know, this uh, company from scratch with a partner, with a business partner, of course, who was completely the opposite of me. So it was great. But long uh, story short. Um, at one, at one moment, we tried something. So we created something new. So that worked. But we had to, it was very political and very complicated to get the, you know, the authorization, whatever it was. And uh, I didn't see that I was trapped. So for months, I took all my energy to try, you know, to, to change and to convince the politics and everything, everybody around me. And I finished, it was December, I was exhausted. And one night I cried and said, you know, I can't, you know, I hit the wall. So I cannot do, I can I, what can I do? And I was trapped. <laughs> because when I was, a, I didn't mention that, but I was also a competitor, and a, you know, a horse rider. And um, so we used to say, you have to fall 100 times, 100 of time before becoming a good rider. So when you fall, you go back to your horse, 
go back to, to your, uh, on, on your saddle. So this is what I, I did at that time. So it didn't work, I came back. It didn't work, I came back. Hey, yeah, but I was exhausted, <laughs> I was locked. <laughs> and, uh, and so I decided, so somebody, you know, somebody told me that and told me, did you look at you? What are you doing, you know? And, uh, and I said, okay. I didn't realize that I have to change my mindset and, and do it differently. So this is what I did. That's a, um, I love that story too, because this was, uh, you'd already become an entrepreneur. You'd already gone through that. You'd had that dream. You yeah. kind of upended your life, your career, yeah. and moved on to something else. So the mind shift had certainly started. And yet you still have that moment, those moments mm -hmm. of being locked, um, which is a nice segue maybe to this question, which is, is becoming unlocked a moment uh, or is it a process? Hmm. And then there's a second part, but let's get this part first. Okay. <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it a moment or a process becoming unlocked? So it's, uh, I would say it's a process, but it's also a moment. Hello, let me explain. A moment, because when you realize, you know, is it true or relevant, for example, and helpful. When you realize at that moment, I can tell you, you feel it. You feel it really is. And it's a process because, as I said, okay, now you open a door. You freed yourself. But now you have to do the journey, write your story, go. So go on the road. So it's a process. It takes time. It works, but it takes time, and it takes a lot of work. Uh, okay, part two of this question <laughs> about becoming unlocked do we do it by ourselves or with others? Okay, uh, both. Both. Um, you can be, you know, triggered by, uh, or you can ask for help, you know, with a professional, with a spiritual leader, with a whoever, a person, uh, or by yourself, by reading books. I, I learned a lot through books, a lot through, um, you know, uh, TED Talks and, and things like that. Um, so you can read a lot and um, be curious and you can unlock yourself. And uh, other than Hubert and Ralph, uh, which leaders do you admire most? Who is most unlocked? Unlock leader? I would say, I would say, a lot of you here, <laughs> I'm sure, uh, but I would say, I would say Ariana, and uh, Ariana, Agape, they are very unlocked and uh, very role modeling also. Ar Ariana, Ariana Pinkton, sorry, yeah. Ariana Pinkton, and, and uh, she's not there today, but uh, and her sister Agape, they are very, you know, very unlocked leader too. Terrific. I think those are all of your questions. They were excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to let you all know that uh, there are books available outside. Hortense will be staying to sign books, uh, so please stick around for that. Um, thank you again to uh, Tony and the library here for wonderful programming and a beautiful space, and to all of you for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony Library. Thank you for coming. And thank you online. <laughs>